Welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast, where we're all about sharing the forbidden secrets and slightly embellished truths about corporate cybersecurity programs. We're ranting, we're raving, and we're telling you the stuff that nobody talks about on their fancy website and trade show giveaways, all to protect you from cyber criminals. And now, here's your hosts, Mike Rotondo, Zach Fuller, and Lauro Chavez. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cyber Rants Podcast. This is your co-host, Zach Fuller, joined by Mike Rotondo and Lauro Chavez. And uh, we are going to have a good conversation today, but before we do, Mike, why don't you kick us off with the news? Good day and welcome to the news. We've got some interesting news. We're not doing the standard stuff today, but uh, first of first of all, we have FBI issues warning of malicious unemployment websites. Apparently, the FBI has warned the U.S. public that threat actors are actively using fake and spoofed unemployment benefit websites to harvest sensitive financial and personal information from unsuspecting victims. Sites used in these attacks are designed to closely resemble official, official government platforms to trick the targets into giving away their info. And these spoofed websites to imitate the appearance of and can be easily mistaken for legitimate websites offering unemployment benefits. Sorry for repeating myself. I'm not that old. They're, they're beating. They're beating people while they're down. Basically, it's like, hey, you're Pretty unemployed. Much. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. we're gonna steal your identity, make you suffer so, uh, even more. That's yeah. how a great walkout, right? It kind of does, oh. and to even dovetail on that, I've seen some really weird LinkedIn job requests ask and say, yeah, you know, if this sounds great, why don't you just send me your number and your email address, and uh, we'll get right to you. Yeah. <laughs> Learn how to flip houses in your spare time. It's a credit card processing fee of only $5. Just enter your card number here. Exactly. It's 48473. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> on another note, Wisconsin Milk Processing Company survives a ransomware attack. Wisconsin State Farmer reported this week that Schreiber, a milk processing company, uh, one of the biggest milk processors in the state, had been hit with a $2.5 million ransom demand after the attack. The attack disrupted the entire milk supply chain, didn't know there was one, uh, because Schreiber uses a variety of digital systems and computers to manage milk processing. Uh, additionally, New Cooperative, an Iowa-based farm service provider, was hit with ransomware attack on September 20th, and Black Matter, a ransomware outfit, demanded a 5.9 million ransom uh, for Crystal Valley based in Minnesota. Both attacks came as harvest began to ramp up for farmers. So uh, additional supply chain issues is uh, ransomware attacking food processor. This I added just because I wanted to say it. FBI meet the Hello Kitty ransomware. FBI has sent a flash alert warning private industry partners that the Hello Kitty ransomware gang, aka Five Hands, has added DDoS attacks to their arsenal of extortion tactics. Hello Kitty is also known for stealing sensitive documents from victims' compromised servers before encrypting them. The exfiltrated files are later used as leverage pressure, pressure the victims into paying the ransom under the threat of leaking the stolen data online. Next, Minecraft Japanese gamers hit by chaos ransomware using alt lists as lure. Fortigard Labs recently discovered a variant of the chaos ransomware that appears to target Minecraft gamers in Japan. The variant not only encrypts certain files, but also destroys others, rendering them unrecoverable. If gamers fall prey to the attack, choosing to pay the ransom may still lead to loss of data. Oh no, they're, they're losing their worlds. Oh, that's just got to be so frustrating because they've just spent <laughs> thousands of hours making their Minecraft worlds and now they're just locked. Uh, <laughs> they, are, they already threw away a bunch of their life. What's a little more, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Hold off further. Coming. Sorry, that was probably very <laughs> offensive to, <laughs> to was, listeners. I'm offended. Some people. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a big gamer. I just, I don't. It's I just, think you, it's you, great. You, you can't use your thumbs for one. So that's true. That my either. thumbs are paralyzed. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, in all fairness, I think game is great. Great to have a hobby and that sort of thing. But it when. When I always see these things about people just completely letting it take over their lives, and that becomes their new reality, that's that's just too far. I used to have a roommate in college that would come home on Friday afternoon, pour himself a glass of scotch, and I wouldn't see him again until Sunday because he'd be in there playing Doom. So wow, yeah, wow. Well, you just dated yourself a little there. Yeah, the, was Doom, Doom One, the original <laughs> Doom. It wasn't, there wasn't know. one, it was Doom. <laughs> it's Doom. It's just Doom. That was, that was Castle like the, Wolfenstein. 
That, that was, was back when he had to, you know, had a coal fired computer. I, was like, I got Quake. I got Quake on the Nintendo Switch. Speaking of gamers, you guys can do whatever you want in your spare time. You know what? I'm going to continue to play video games, and you can just sip your scotch and pet your cats and <laughs> what, ride your mountain bike. That's fine. What, what is the spare so, time you speak of? I, I don't spare. Okay. Like so, as an excess extra time? No, no. I'm talking. That's, I'm talking about. Look, all I really need is you know, fifteen to twenty five minutes just sporadically throughout the day that's really all that's really all i need to 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 get things just right and still stay co connected with the gamer community and the gamer and myself first off so yeah. um you know anyways but yeah you shouldn't you should you seriously shouldn't like be sneaking out of work early to go you know play, <laughs> play halo that, Infinite. <laughs> that's a that's a healthy amount of gaming and that's what gaming is good for right it's uh, those little breaks and things like that not uh 16 hour binges where you drink Mountain Dew and eat donuts the whole time. What do you yeah. got against Mountain Dew donuts <laughs> and playing games? I still fail to understand the, the reasoning behind this. Sounds fantastic. The Star Wars movies playing in the background, too. I, mean, <laughs> I don't have to drink the Mountain Dew, but it can be there. You know what I mean? I'm going to eat a donut. So but it's, Star Wars movies, it's the Star Wars anime. I, look, I used to go to land parties. Look, let me tell you something. I would <clears throat> look, there were times on deployments. And you've seen pictures. I don't have to. This is public knowledge. There's times in deployments where we might have been playing some multiplayer video games. Okay. Because, well, it was spades or dominoes or hearts or pinochle. I don't, I don't still understand that one. Or, you know, we could do multiplayer with the techies. <laughs> and, you know, it would be two versus everybody else because, you know, there's only really two gamers. Um, so that always made it fun. Uh, but in any case, you know, I mean, everybody has their thing. Everybody has their thing. Yeah, deployments. I, I, when we weren't out out in the field fighting, it was always uh, fixing the the diesel generator, and and uh, that was that was my my game. <laughs> that was your game. Diesel generators, fun. yeah, because when that goes down, all the air conditioning and the the cooling units and stuff in your tent, uh, your tent go down, and nobody's happy. That's right. Nobody's so now you know. What, now you know what it feels like to lose a Minecraft world right now. So, okay, I guess. I guess that's right. It comes full circle. Anyway, sorry, it took us way off topic. <laughs> <laughs> circle back. Carry, circle back. Carry, carry on. on. So uh, the next story we have is Google to pay hackers. I have no idea how they came up with this number: thirty-one thousand three hundred thirty-seven dollars for exploiting patched Linux kernel flaws. It's like someone just rolled some dice and went, "Hey, this number works." Uh, Google announced that it will pay security researchers to find exploits using vulnerabilities previously remediated or otherwise over the next three months as part of a new bug bounty program to improve their security of the Linux kernel. Google is expected to issue rewards worth $31,337 for exploiting privilege escalation in a lab environment for the past vulnerability, an amount that can climb to $50,337 for working exploits that take advantage of zero-day flaws in the kernel and other undocumented attack techniques. Again, where they came up with these numbers, I don't know. But anyway, if you got some spare time and you're not gaming or fixing the diesel generator, Google will pay you to hack, so. That's, that's cool, that seems seems reasonable. Seems like reasonable funds, reasonable pay for fun. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a weird number though, you know? It is kind of weird. It's easier getting paid hacking for Google than it is playing Fortnite Pro, I'm just saying. <laughs> Probably. All right, that's all I got. Laura, what do you got for us? Oh, I'm sorry. I was playing games. <clears throat> Let me get back to the podcast here. So for, for exploits this week, you know, I, I just want to bring up, I guess I'll, I'll preface the conversation with saying we're not going to talk about WordPress beyond this 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 episode. So you've, if you've listened to the past 40, what, whatever million episodes that we've had, I can't remember, but you can go back. Six is it 636,000 episodes, anyways? But we're we're pretty much we're ending the conversation on on WordPress from an exploit plugin perspective. If you're going to play with fire, well, you should wear some oven mitts. So uh, if you if you don't know, go back and listen. And if you're still um, if you're still out there, just make sure you do your homework. Um, if you're using that software, um, this week we're going to talk about Fuel CMS. It's a content management um, application. It's got a um, remote code execution on version 1.4.1. And so this payload exists out there for Metasploit. We pull this in uh, and we can execute this against the 
the remote uh, the remote system pretty much immediately. So if you've got 1.4.1 of fuel CMS, make sure you're upgrading that. And uh, to bring back the, <clears throat> speaking of Meow, the Hello Kitty gang, right? Let's <laughs> let's talk about the Meow attack. Okay, this if you don't remember, this happened back in um, in the summer of 2020. It was a it was a data did not, we're not gonna get, this was a database grab is really what it was database grab and destroy pillage. It was barbaric is what it was. Okay, so the Ericsson network location MPS like GPC. There's a so this is what's probably happened to a lot of the feedlots with the malware is that they're probably using a lot of this Ericsson network location stuff that goes up on towers, right? And so, anyways, if you're using that that GMPC 21, you want to you want to get off of that right now and get get your support team to get those those systems upgraded, or at least try to segment them from the internet because um, the Metasploit payload for that for that attack is pretty much there now. And so it does um, remote code execution with the Ericsson network location gear running on that that GMP C21. So um, make sure you're you're trying to get off of that. So I, I kind of was you know curious, and that, that's speculation, right? We don't we don't know that for a fact, but we we know that a lot of these agricultural organizations are leveraging technology, and because they have equipment and they have large lots and large places, they're they're you know kind of spanned out using some of this supported array. Um, for internet mesh and location mesh and everything else over there, giant farms and, and giant ranches that they have. So you know, it's it's it, to me, it's kind of heartbreaking that they're they're kicking us in that in that part of the part of the chest. It's pretty painful. But um, so if you're if you're leveraging into that Ericsson stuff, get 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 checking with your reps and all that, and see if you can't get get yourself updated in a in a timely manner. That's all we have for exploit this week. Again, not going to mention WordPress. No more WordPress. We're not allowed to say. That's the final time we say it. It is the unspoken. The unspeakable. The unspoken. Sadly, I will continue to mention Microsoft. <laughs> kind of hard to get out of that <laughs> one. You're just that's just that's just main that's just main mainstream news. Yeah. So uh, yeah. can't can't not cover it. But that said, well, outstanding. Let's uh, dive into some other topics and see where our conversation takes us. But before we do, take a quick break, get some water, and be right back. Want even more Cyber Rants? Be sure to subscribe to the Cyber Rants podcast. Get your copy of our best-selling book, Cyber Rants, on Amazon today. This podcast is brought to you by Silent Sector, the firm dedicated to building world-class cybersecurity programs for mid-market and emerging companies across the U.S. Silent Sector also provides industry-leading penetration tests and cyber risk assessments. Visit SilentSector.com and contact us today. And we're back. Well, there's a lot happening in the world of cybersecurity. I think that's pretty pretty obvious. A uh, lot of new things, but a lot that's the same too, right? A lot of fundamentals um, that need to be in place and all that. But um, I thought we'd start with um, some of the things that are going well. I mean, I, I think that there, I think the industry is is uh, quite a ways ahead of where it was, say, five years ago. All right, so um, that's good. I mean, I know we we joke a lot, we talk a lot about all the stuff that's wrong, how it should be. That's kind of the cyber rants, right? Ranting about what's going on and um, kind of where where things are missing the mark. But that said, um, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of of activity in just the um, education space and trying to get people into this industry. So that's been good. There's a lot more people, and I get people. Um, reaching out um, pretty regularly, uh, students in their in their um, bachelor's and master's programs asking, okay, well, I'm doing these things. What else should I be doing? Certifications, that sort of thing. So that's encouraging. People, the the industry has become um, much more front and center and recognized as an actual industry, not a subset of IT uh, like before. And then um, as a result, I think it's breeding more talent. Um, so that's something I'll point out, I think is going well. Um, and then another thing I think is going well is, um, although it's not all about tools and technologies, right? That's, as we say over and over, really comes down to the human element. You know, I think there's good, good progress made and in, in some things that can create efficiencies for organizations and some really cool stuff out there that does like really good capabilities for endpoint protection, that sort of thing. So um, a few other things going on, but um, I'd say those are, those are some of the main ones, you know, we, we have, there's certainly we, other things that we could talk about in the compliance realm and stuff that's not quite 
like we we want to see it happen. But that said, what do you guys think? Any anything new happening that's caught your eye that you're excited about? I'm sorry, I was playing video games again. What were we talking about? Yeah, no, you know, I I think those are two great great things to bring up. Um, I will bring up a compliance thing because I'm really excited to see this. Um, when you're a dinosaur like Mike, and you've been through pretty much, you know, everything in IT, you remember when, you know, I'm a CISP... <laughs> you are. Like a rock. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, the questionnaire, the security questionnaire has been a thing that <laughs> we've kind of watched evolve for the last almost 20 years. And now seeing it really have traction in the industry and organizations like PCI, and and lightness that are you know kind of talking about this this kind of proactive vendor management um, stuff that are kind of helping these companies really develop these questionnaires, and and they're advocating cybersecurity. They don't they don't know it. They think they're trying to meet compliance, but really what they're doing is they're advocating cybersecurity, and this has sort of caused this 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 chain of 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 effect right with all these organizations now being met with at the other end of this and saying, oh wow, I've never. I've never seen this type of, you know, this type of inquisition before, you know, about our technical and, and, and security capabilities. So it's, I, I like to, I think, I think that's a good thing to talk about is that's really, really invoked. I'd, I'll call it a cyber security revolution. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and coin it that because I, I think it's safe to say that, like you said, Zach, a lot has changed in the last five years. We've seen a huge ramp and a lot of things has probably been because we've had to, right? I mean, we've been under consistent attack for 20 years from the cyber, from the cyber perspective, maybe longer. Um, ever since the internet was connected pretty, pretty much with anybody outside of the United States and our, to any university, I'll just say that because, you know, there's always the, the university guys. So, <clears throat> cult of the dead cow. <laughs> Anyways, but, you know, like there's, I think there's a, um, you know, if you're, if you're not from a little bit Texas, then that might not make sense. But if you, um, if you look at the, that, that evolution of the questionnaire and, and how it's kind of provoked these companies to kind of self-ignite this cybersecurity, this cybersecurity, um, you know, call it just a, like a, like a roadmap <laughs> that they don't know where they're going, but they're like, I gotta, I gotta go someplace. Like, right? so where do I go? You, know, you, you buy cyber rants, of course, but, um, <laughs> You know, I, I think that we've really seen that cyber revolution happen over over the last probably you know two or three years, really starting to take traction in the industry. Um, and you can just, I mean, we could tell it with our business, I'm sure all the other cybersecurity, we can see it with the need for professionals being higher than ever, you know, and um, the need for uh, American companies to to do something is is higher than ever. So what what better time really? You know, well, so that's what I see as good. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that a lot with startups in that they're getting hit with these and they're reaching out to companies like us to say, how do we deal with this? So it's good. And especially if you're a startup, you're building from green fields and can build it to be secure from the start as opposed to trying to retrofit security, which is always a problem. Yeah. And that's what our hope would be, right? Is that everybody would put cybersecurity up front, right? Those, those, you know, understanding what data they're going to have and how they should, how they should handle it. And, <clears throat> how they should prevent misuse and, and those sorts of things with, with their technologies is, is should be like top of mind, not how are we going to make a million dollars off everybody? You know, I mean, yeah, the, the, these companies, even small businesses now are, are finally um, starting to see cybersecurity as a requirement and putting resources into it. And um, out, out of that too, and, and larger um, enterprises that have um, a chief information security officer, right? They are getting a better seat um, at the table, right? I think that it's been a, a long, long time. They've been they've been there, they've been around, but a lot of times are um, just not really heard or kind of like, you know, you sit in the corner because you're not driving revenue, that sort of thing. And I think that 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 discussion is changing. They're showing ways that they can make the company better overall and um, really getting getting heard um, and to the point where some will report directly to the board, right? Because the boards are that that concerned and realize that it's it's of such importance that now they um, want to make sure that their that their organization is covered. So a lot of a lot of visibility increase oh, just in the last five years or so. Well, I'm also seeing that CISOs are getting more technical. There's a long time it was someone that made a lateral move from accounting or something like that to oversee cybersecurity and we're now seeing security professionals moving into those roles in a lot of ways yeah technical leadership thank you mike that's a great point we're seeing more technical leadership where it needs to be 
um, technical leadership and not, you know, executive leadership that just because you're good at, you know, quote unquote, being a, you yeah. know, a director or whatever, right? So, you know, it, <clears throat> it gleans more respect from your, from your peers and your subordinates and that whole bit. Um, the other thing I think I'll say is um, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I really feel as part of the cyber evolution that's happening, right, that we've re we're starting as a whole in the United States to lower our attack surface. I think, you know, all the questionnaires and, and all the drive for um, a more rigorous cybersecurity program and, you know, following a framework and that is, it leads to that continuous scanning, which, you know, as a byproduct leads to that reduced, um, you know, vulnerability surface because you're not, you know, using a, you realize that the Windows 10 server, you have a patch for, you know, four years, probably needs to be updated now because the scanner is barking all kinds of red colors at you. So, I mean, things like that are good, right? Even, you know, we've, we've seen from our own clients um, that that surface being really narrowed down to where it's almost non-existent. Now, there's always going to be trusted software zero days. There's nothing we can do to get around that. Um, you know, that, that's going to happen in all pretty much products. You're going to have the, you know, the cigar humidifier that you buy that, you know, comes out after like four days. Um, or the blender or, you know, the vehicle or, you know, so, you know, trusted software is always going to have that potential, which I, I'd like to see more companies do what Google's, I wish Microsoft would reach out, like Google's reached out and offer a more, I guess, unified bounty system for identifying stuff with them, you know, and, and are in a real like shot at open development. Um, just speaking of companies that didn't put cybersecurity first, anyways. If, if Microsoft... If Microsoft offers thirty-one thousand three hundred and seventy-eight dollars instead yeah. of three hundred and thirty-seven dollars, there they'll be a step ahead. So that's a free business tip to Microsoft. I won't even charge a consulting fee for that. We'll waive the three fifty an hour. Yeah, yeah. They want to be leaked, right, with the money that they're given. They should they should put like, you know, maybe I don't know, like fourteen threes behind it with no periods or commas. There you so go. That's that's fine. <laughs> That'd be enough. That'd be enough. That'd be enough. And then I would say that, you know, you'd probably get a lot of good researchers coming to help you out. Yeah, you know, and speaking of technical leadership, I would really rather have someone with 20 years of experience with no college education who's been working in IT security for that amount of time than some new graduate of Kellogg Business School or one of those being a C-level executive as a CISO. And I don't think the college education prepares you for the actual real world issues of cybersecurity. So. No, we're gonna have to start some sort of like educational piece. And, and I guess, you know, I think a lot of the, um, it, it really doesn't. I think it's good that, you know, you know Zach, you'd mentioned that we've got, we've got educational programs towards that now. And, and I think that's a really good thing. And I think that a lot of these schools are providing really good, um, you know, labs and things for the students to to really get a get an idea of the fundamentals of cybersecurity and and just basic IT IT function work, right? So I think it's really good that they're doing. But you know, we I think in the past we we can also attest that you know some of the more governance and compliance driven pieces that are more prevalent are kind of weaker, right? I mean, it's you know everybody wants to be a pen tester, but uh, you know, unfortunately, that's on you know for an organization that's a real small amount of work. Um, it, it's an important piece of work, but it's a small piece of the of a larger uh, machine that's running in cybersecurity. Well, the other yeah. thing we're having issues with is we're still getting people that are conflating compliance with security. And I you know, ran into this with a client recently where, you know, well, well, we're doing the minimum for the compliance solution, but that's not making you secure. So that's something that we need to focus on, too, that I still sure. think yeah. you need more education. So. Yeah, but it's getting better, right? I mean, yeah. I, mean when, I mean, it's 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 absolutely getting better. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're still going to have, you know, the the people that are, you know, the, the organizations and individuals that are behind. But I think as a whole that, you know, we are, you know, moving forward. I think there's there's certainly a lot of momentum that that, mm -hmm. that America has made in general and the companies here that, that we see have made in general to move toward a more secure environment and, and to be more careful with their with their customer data. Whether they wanted to or not, I mean, there's been a lot of cyber attacks. I mean, it just it when you see your when you see your when you see your neighbors' houses, you know, get toilet papered, it makes you like want to stand guard, you know, <laughs> you know, and how <laughs> so yeah, it's like you're like, wow, you just got toilet papered. We need to really start putting out the full size candy bars. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, it makes you it just makes you want to be aware, right? Um, it's like, yeah, well, Jim only put out the little, you know, the little Halloween, the little what are those little triangle oh, things, the cones, the cones or whatever those things are, they're terrible. <laughs> oh, the, um, 
candy corns. <laughs> candy corns, that's what they are. <laughs> he only put out the candy corns. Look what they did to his house. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a single candy corn. I forgot about those. I didn't have a single one this Halloween. Man, I feel like I missed the whole season. Well, you know, we talked day. about that company that got hacked that makes candy corns a couple weeks ago, so maybe that's why. Oh, <laughs> that's true. That's funny. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want to interrupt you when you were giving the news last week, but since we're having the <clears throat> kind of, you know, you know, fend for yourself today. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, <laughs> I think that was great. I was thinking that in my back of my head too. I was like, I wonder, cause it's like the most horrible Halloween candy. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not as kids. Bad as peeps. <laughs> like we yeah, need to our... stop the kids from getting this candy. Cause we have, we have a group of individuals that think that all the kids want that. <laughs> we need to stop I... it. My my daughter, I was not that I was perusing through her Halloween candy or anything. Would never do that. But oh, no, never, um, never. if if I if I did, um, you know, just looking for maybe like maybe a, um, a Twix or something like that, I um, came across a bunch of milk duds, and I couldn't believe people still give those out. But maybe there's still some time. milk duds. Thing. You know, in the time it took you to poison your body with milk duds, you could have lost to me in Fortnite or whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's about all the time it would take. 15 seconds. But uh, but yeah. That, would have been better well, for think... you. A bit of more, health, more healthy. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Not better for my emotions, though. Sure. Oh, no. That's... Dopamine. <laughs> no. No, there are dances in that game to give you emotional um, outreach when you're done. So yeah, you'd be. Yeah. I think I'm I'm excited about what's to come because we've we've got this. So cybersecurity industry, you could you could say is is brand new, relatively speaking, to like the automotive industry or the pharmaceutical industry or you know commodities out there on um, farming and stuff like that. But uh, with that, we're going to get people that come into the profession. Uh, as technical individuals grow up in it, um, become CISOs. I think that's going to certainly provide, you know, more talent, more capability for the the nation as a whole, which is awesome. We just, we got to get on the same page about some, some standards. Um, like you were saying, Mike, about compliance, right? We got to get everybody on board with some holistic security frameworks that protect the whole organization, not just segments of data. Um, right. And I think once we can do that, we'll 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 achieve some good things. But um, and I think the next thing to come is, and it's already forming, is it? it um, and I think they go very much hand in hand. But uh, the industry around uh, disinformation, uh, counter you know countering disinformation, that sort of thing. I think we'll start to get more organizations popping up that deal in that business, and then. Um, counterintelligence stuff rights for helping companies that are you know potentially hiring malicious actors uh, you know threat actors and that sort of thing unknowingly right um so that i could see some new some you know newer industries popping up as a result of just the necess- necessity i mean it's unfortunate that any of this has to exist but just out of necessity it's going to create jobs for people opportunity and i think it's going to make us stronger as a nation well yeah and you know i think that i think it will too and i think that you know it's somebody has to you know i think disinformation might be a cybersecurity problem um you know and you know keeping keeping data integrity high prevents that that sort of you know that sort of a capability right you're always going to have you know the psyops sort of situation happening but if your data is irrepeatable then you know it's it's easy to go back and point to that right and and so it i think you're right i think you'll see you know, I'll see areas grow in that in those spaces, trying to trying to tackle that that you know kind of disinformation problem. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of a lot of um, like going back to the you know schools and students and that sort of thing too. I think that out of necessity, um, unlike any other industry that I know of that I'm aware of. Um, people are going to be growing up within organizations and and probably uh, advancing in their um, jobs and their responsibilities and leadership quicker than than other businesses. And I mean, we certainly see that in our own business, right? Bring, bringing up people, giving them skill sets, um, right? And 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 really helping them grow. And um, I think a lot of other organizations are, you know, 
that that aren't doing maybe aren't doing the same thing will certainly um, over the next five years start out, out of again out of necessity bringing people up advancing people quicker through their career paths um, so long as they have the you know the attitude and the aptitude to do it um, they they'll um, we'll see a, see a lot of growth so it's going to be a great great industry for people for a long long time. I'd like to yeah, see more women so. in the industry too. Same. Yeah, just, yeah, there's, there's, you know, all, you know, I think all genders need to, you know, be involved in this, you know, but we, you know, this has been an industry that has been most heavily male. Absolutely. And so to have, have more female technicians and more female coders would just be great. They have better attitudes towards the stuff they do too. No offense, guys. I think women look at code differently than men. I mean, it, it, I think you'd see a lot of advances coming if, if women coders were, I don't know. I, I I just had the perspective that they, you know the way they view world slightly differently than yeah. men. Well, they got us to the moon and saved everybody. a whole bunch of pilots and that whole bit, right? So yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe we should, be, yeah, we should be encouraging them to be in cybersecurity. To probably probably help us a whole lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's and there's certainly have seen more groups pop up around that too. I I don't know the statistics. If anybody listening knows or has any insight to this or or as an expert in it and would like to join us on the show, we'd love to have you, but um, that's something I don't, I don't see a lot of as, you know, what are the percentages um, of, uh, of women coming into the industry? What, what uh, is, is it growing? Um, you know, that sort of thing. And just people in general, I mean, I, I'd be interesting to see how many people are transitioning from other career fields into cybersecurity. Um, I just, it's not something I've looked into recently. Um, so it'd be, be curious to see what the latest latest metrics are. I'm making assumptions based off of what we see and who we talk to, right? But that's a that's a limited limited scope, limited vantage point. So I'd be interested. Sure. In, uh, again, if, if you're out there uh, listening, give us your comments, feedback, and um, you know if you if you're an expert in this this particular area of kind of the the metrics behind what's going on with with talent, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of cyber of women in cybersecurity management and project management. What I haven't seen is a lot of coders and security analysts and you know firewall techs. Yeah, I think I think maybe the you know there I think a lot is driven towards the gaming industry, and so I think if we if we look at that industry, then I think you certainly have a really probably a pretty good solid um, female demographic there for for the workforce just because of. Um, you know, the ability to, to really use your imagination. And, and so those art driven, you know, those art driven individuals, you know, kind of, if they want to get into tech and coding, they lean more towards that, that gaming visual arts type um, area, right? And so maybe hope, hoping maybe some of those in their spare time will want to come over to cybersecurity, right? Because, um, you know, you can, it's, it's pretty easily translatable, right? The, the, the precision that you need to create um, that art also is, you know, the, the same could be said about the code used to, you know, build a, a, a you know, a SaaS application for an organization, right? So um, hopefully we'll see, or at least to audit it, right? Um, and so I think, I think I'm, I'm hoping here in the future that the, the need will be so great in cybersecurity um, for talent of all types that they'll, they'll hopefully be driven over from that industry, at least maybe even part-time. Mm -hmm. We'll cross a lot of traditional business uh, hurdles to in this industry and are doing it already because we can hire people um, on a fractional basis, on a part-time basis as, as an industry with specific skill sets and allow people, I mean, cybersecurity people have worked at home, you know, forever. It's not, it's not a new thing in, in this industry. Um, but I think with the, you know, the new kind of the new way of working, um, people want flexible hours, flexible schedules. They want to be measured by you know, results, not just punching the clock. And this industry absolutely allows that. So we'll get people that, um, you know, maybe uh, maybe single parents, for example, that are that are at, at home and, and, and they need to watch the kids and they need to work certain hours. Um, this is this industry provides a lot of opportunity that they that they could take advantage that maybe other um, a lot of other industries would would um, they'd have to shy away from because it would take them away from their more important, you know, duties with their, you know, watching their kids and family. So um, there's a lot of flexibility here. I think we're going to see that that grow. And as a result, too, we're going to see, you know, more and more talent enter uh, for that reason over time. So it, it's not 
certainly not something that will happen overnight, but I mean, I, I think, you know, as much as we rant about the um, things that should be changed and, and how people should change their thinking and that sort of thing, that's really for awareness, but I believe we're, we're headed in the right direction. A lot more to do, but as long as we keep the course, we will prevail. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that being said, not to be Debbie Downer, but the head of the Pentagon's AI department quit because he said we're so far behind the Chinese, there's no point. So nobody likes a quitter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody, right. Somebody else he got somebody else he got paid to say that by the Chinese. What a that's what happened. Yeah. He, he could have he, he walked he off believed, the money. He believed their psyops campaigns, right? <laughs> Yeah, did he see and the got data paid. himself? And if he, he did see the this, data himself, then I know more than me that he got paid to say. <laughs> he brought in this new innovative software called Windows 95. And uh, that's high tech. <laughs> wanted to get it deployed. High tech, Sorry, outstanding. Well, well, yeah, I mean, that would, imagine imagine if there was like a commanding generals, oh, well, this, uh, we can't, we're, I'm just going to quit because it's too hard to fight the Taliban. You know, I mean, that's like the same thing. That's so that person needs to be out of there and uh, guns are loud. <laughs> guns are loud. Yeah. I don't, I don't like them. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be a four star general anymore. Like if that ever happened, we'd be the country would be up in arms. But we'll <laughs> never be I guess the Chinese. This is a, They're so far ahead of us. They have pagers. Oh. So <laughs> I'm not gonna help. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quit. Oh, you guys take care of it. That's good. That's uh, man. Hope that we'll never beat the Chinese. I heard once they had television. <laughs> <laughs> color, color television. Color television. Wow. Well, that said, we're coming up on time. Any any other snarky remarks before we jump off? Yeah, I got one snarky remark for everybody out there who's wondering, well, I know you heard Laura and Zach and Mike talk about getting into cybersecurity. I'd really like to see a lot more organizations open up internships for um, for individuals that that have a desire to be in this industry. So if you're, if you're out there and listening and you, you run an organization and, and you have even just one cybersecurity person um, that's doing your work for you, and even if he's the IT person too, you should still open up an internship to let some of the youth come in and that want to play a part in this and um, allow them to be a part of that and to, and to learn this um, quicker than they can maybe going through college. So I'd, I'd certainly like to see you do your parts. That's my along, remark. Along those lines, you want the people that want to do it, not people that are uh, want to be mercenaries. Or like, oh, well, cybersecurity looks like a good field, so I can go make money. I want to go do this because that is not the person that's going to, you know what I mean? The, the, when money is their sole driving factor, that's not necessarily what the best person for the job. You want yeah, some better passion about it. Absolutely. That's what happened to the medical profession. Excellent point. Excellent point. Well, great. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you found this episode interesting. Hope there, there was some good information here, or at least things to, to consider and think about. And um, you're always welcome to leave us your comments, uh, cyberrightspodcast.com or, or reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, and we are, we are there. We want to hear from you. And um, if you haven't subscribed, of course, subscribe. Love, love that as well. Help get the show around to uh, more people and get this information out there because the world needs to know more about cybersecurity. And that's why we're doing what we do. So have a great rest of your day and we will see you on the next episode. Pick up your copy of the Cyber Ants book on Amazon today. And if you're looking to take your cybersecurity program to the next level, visit us online at www.silentsector.com. Join us next time for another edition of the Cyber Ants podcast.